in Islam, children are seen as being in a state of purity. Um, so they're free of sin. And this is what we refer to as fitra. And so they're in a stage of wonder and they incline, of course, to exploration and play. So there is a great emphasis on allowing them to be children, but also to nurture them with love and gently guide them towards good behavior, virtuous behavior, proper etiquette, which is um, defined in the Arabic term here as adab. And children should also be introduced to the six articles of faith in Islam, which are really make up the creed of, of what a Muslim believes in, which entail the belief in the oneness of God, the angels, Muslims believe in a presence of, of uh, the angelic realm, in messengers that were sent by God to convey the message of truth, the holy books, which include the gospel, as well as the Torah, the Psalms of David, um, and then, of course, the Quran, and then the day of judgment, that there will be ultimately a reality where we will stand before God and account for ourselves, and divine decree. And obviously, this would all be done in age-appropriate ways, um, and we really uh, try to stay away from concepts like punishment and hell and the demonic realm, although these are certainly part of the creed of a believer. In those early stages, we try to emphasize more um, things that a young child, because of their imagination, uh, that, that it could uh, align with that and not um, you know, induce any type of fear. So, And then later, as they mature, we can introduce those, those elements. And then, um, of course, virtuous behavior through storytelling. So there's a great emphasis on telling stories from previous prophets, from saintly people, um, as well as role modeling. So adults are also responsible to make sure that they possess those same virtues and allow children to, to really mature um, gradually and, and organically in that way. So that's the first stage of childhood. And then we move into the second stage, which is that pre-adolescent stage. And this is now the stage of instruction. And this is where children are to be taught, and the emphasis is on learning the fundamentals of practical faith, right? How faith moves beyond belief, but into action. So in this uh, stage, youth are understood to have reached the age of what we call discernment, and they, are, they know right from wrong. So they should be taught self-discipline through proper behavior, right? Morality, chastity, piety, proper speech, so truthfulness avoiding idle talk, speaking about things that are of no benefit, foul language, uh, they should not speak in foul language. They should also dress properly, which would be modest and loose fitting clothing. So this would be all of the things that in this stage of pre-adolescence, a child would be instructed with. And then also the importance of time management and structure. So in Islam, as we'll get to in a moment, there are many components of the ritual faith that actually have to do with um, schedule and time and structure. And so children are introduced to these ideas early. And that includes, you know, the requisites of worship, which would have to do with uh, lustration or ablution. And this is the ritual wash that Muslims do before prayer. And also the ritual bath that we do uh, to purify oneself out of certain states like menstruation, for example. Um, and then also being taught the five pillars in a more detailed way. So in this stage, that pre-adolescent stage, children should would typically receive this instruction. And just for those who are not familiar with the five pillars of Islam, the five pillars are basically the the aspects of the, the faith that really support the faith of a, of a Muslim believer. The first would be the declaration of faith, which is just testifying in the oneness of God and the prophethood of Muhammad. And once a person does that in with witnesses, they would be considered a Muslim. And at that point, they would then be taught how to pray five times a day or more. There are optional supererogatory prayers that one can do, but there are prescribed prayers every single day from the dawn prayer, noon prayer, afternoon, evening, and then late evening, uh, or I'm sorry, dusk, night, night prayer, and then the late evening or night prayer. So th those are spread out throughout the day. And so these are the this is the type of instruction that a, a young adolescent would receive to understand the meanings of the prayer uh, and the times of the prayer, the way to prepare for the prayer, and also what to say during the prayer. 
And then the zakat is just something that they would know, but not necessarily expected to pay, which would be a tithing or a two percent, two and a half percent of one's savings that they would give to um, the needy, the poor, usually through a mosque or an organization. The fasting, which we just had the month of Ramadan, is also the fourth pillar of Islam, and this is to really practice restraint, um, abstinence, to uh, feel for the needy and the hungry and the poor, to um, to feel empathy towards them. And then uh, the Hajj, which is the once-in-a-lifetime pilgrimage to Mecca. So a, a pre-adolescent would, re would receive all of this instruction and understand that these are um, aspects of their faith that eventually, as they reach adulthood and maturity, they would be responsible for. And then the last stage of that adolescence period is the stage of accountability. And this is when they are really taught to establish a strong faith identity and to have consistent practice. So here, um, you know, they're, they are seen as spiritually adults. Um, and so uh, understanding that they are accountable for themselves and that they are now, um, you know, that their deeds are being recorded, right? So in Islam, there is an idea, the idea that our deeds are being recorded, that there are scribes in the form of angels uh, with every individual writing their good and their bad deeds. And at the age of um, this period where a child reaches the stage of, um, you know, adolescence fully, uh, again, the onset of the period or other physiological changes, then they would be responsible for themselves. And now they would be taught um, about the importance of uh, rectifying oneself and, and coming to terms with one's own, um, you know, spiritual challenges. So we have uh, an entire body of, of study in Islam that um, helps individuals to understand what we would coin maybe today as spiritual psychology, the diseases of the heart, spiritual diseases, right? Um, you know, anger, rancor, envy, all of these, similar to the seven deadly sins, uh, really helping um, youth to come to grips with how they can overcome those and what is required to overcome those types of diseases. We would also define for them the four evils of the world, which which uh, start with the e the ego, the that that one's own uh, lower base self is actually considered an impediment to God, right? That it would um, it would challenge one spiritually, and then desires, right? Vacillating desires and whims um, that are you know that change and fluctuate. That those are also evils, the temptations of the material world and the devil. So uh, defining these four. Um, you know, uh, obstructions or, or, or uh, evils that come between one and God for, for the youth is important. And then to practice self-restraint, abstinence, uh, spiritual discipline. This, this comes through consistent worship, those five daily prayers that are spread out. It comes through fasting, through being more charitable, through serving other people, especially the needy and the poor. So the, this stage of adolescence is, is really where we see um, a growth and a maturation again, uh, because of um, the culmination of all of these different stages. So when we move from that, now we can explore the rites of passage that are commonly practiced in many Muslim cultures. Um, so first, uh, uh, the first thing would be um, the introduction to and the emphasis on purification and hygiene. Uh, there are many quotes uh, from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and other uh, passages of the Quran that talk about purity and cleanliness as being very essential to the practice of a Muslim. So ritual cleanliness is, uh, is, is early, uh, introduced early to young children. Uh, boys are circumcised in Islam, generally at birth or before the age of seven. Uh, children are also washed regularly. Even after using the restroom, they are taught to wash and not just, um, you know, uh, clean. I mean, th there's a specific way of cleanly, uh, cleaning themselves, but water is definitely used. And then also they're taught the steps of lustration, which is um, in Arabic will do. And this is what one does to prepare for the prayer or preparing for the recitation of the Quran. There are certain ritual acts that requ are re required one, uh, require one to be in a state of ritual cleanliness. And so the, a child would be instructed on how to do that. And then uh, young pre-adolescent girls are also taught about menarche or menstruation and how to purify themselves 
for prayer and ritual worship after that. So this would be one of the ways that um, younger children are introduced to, again, this uh, aspect of, 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 um, of the faith. And then the components of prayer, um, introducing children to components of prayer is also something that happens generally around the age of seven to 10. So children, for example, would, would always, even younger children, be encouraged to pray alongside their parents um, just uh, in congregation, standing next to the prayer uh, parents or the adults, um, even older siblings, and learning the motions of the prayer. Um, and at that point, if they, um, you know, uh, if the parents wish to, they could certainly teach them uh, some of the 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 uh, passages of the Quran or the supplications that they would recite, but it would not be required of them to pray five times a day or to do any of that. It would be more just practice practice. And then they could certainly do that at the mosque as well. And then when a child does reach um, the age of 10, oftentimes after that, those few years of practice and kind of getting into the, the habit of prayer, they would then have what is typically called a prayer party, um, and uh, this would be, again, when a child is now ready to uh, commit to praying regularly with the family or independently, completely on their own because they have all of the uh, prayers memorized. So then th there would be a party, some ceremonial party with friends and family to uh, inaugurate this new uh, phase of, of the child's uh, prayer relationship with prayer. Um, and so that would be uh, around the age of 10, typically. Um, then we also have other uh, customs for um, when a child is introduced to memorizing or reading the Quran in Arabic. Um, as, as you may know, the Quran um, is recited in Arabic from Muslims of all backgrounds and all different uh, uh, languages. They are taught in the Arabic language how to pray and how to read the Quran. So many families will actually, from a very young age, teach some of those um, uh, fundamental uh, chapters of the Quran, for example, the very first chapter of the Quran is called Al-Fatiha, which means the opening, and that is the uh, main uh, chapter that is read in every single unit of prayer multiple times a day. So oftentimes, parents will introduce that um, for, to young children, as well as some of the other supplications. And then also the Arabic language itself, learning phonics, the recognition of the letters, learning how to read. So a lot of young children actually do oftentimes know how to read Arabic. Even if they are not fluent in Arabic, they will know the Arabic letters, their songs and a lot of videos and uh, other, um, you know, children made for children, uh, you know, um, ways for, for children to learn. And then um, once a child in some cultures, um, once a child is ready to actually begin to read the Quran for the very first time, um, that some cultures will have what they call a bismillah ceremony or party, which bismillah means in the name of God. And that is the very first thing that one reads when they read the Quran. So that's why it's called bismillah. And it just symbolizes that this is the onset of a child's uh, relationship with reading the Quran for the first time. So some parents will hold an, a ceremony with their family and friends, sometimes at a mosque in a larger setting and invite community members to honor the child's um, you know, intention to read the Quran. And then at the end of that, when the child actually completes the entire reading cover to cover, they will have an amin or amen, which is how uh, prayers are concluded, of course, um, party. And that, uh, again, symbolizes that the child has completed an entire reading of the Quran cover to cover. So these are ways that many children um, find, again, ways to celebrate their own unique relationship in the faith. Uh, we also have... Um, other uh, ways that uh, some cultures uh, like to address uh, aspects, again, of the faith uh, I mentioned before, um, the encouraging uh, encouragement of, of modest dress. And it's really important that young children from an early age are encouraged to dress 
modestly. So you will find sometimes if you see pictures of, of Muslim children at Islamic schools or even in the mosque, you may find them modeling after their mothers or other uh, figures in their family, the dress. So they may wear the hijab as I am wearing right now, young girls, or um, what we call a kufi, which is similar to the uh, the Jewish skull cap um, that, that um, uh, Jews wear, but a little bit larger. So you may find children dressing like that at an early age. They're not required to dress that way, but it's more just, again, encouraging them so that when they reach that age of maturity, maturation, and what we would refer to as adulthood in Islam, that they are now responsible and really do see themselves um, to or, or take on the practice of modest dress. And then in, in other cultures, young girls specifically, when they are ready, and it is their decision uh, to wear the hijab. So when they decide for themselves that they want to commit to wearing full time the headdress or the hijab, um, they will, in some cultures, have a crowning ceremony or a party uh, to again um, celebrate the young girl's intention because she wants to commit to a life of wearing the hijab. So these are all uh, very commonly um, practiced customs to again introduce young children to these concepts. And then uh, lastly, here we have the introduction to what we refer to as Sunnah sports. And this just uh, Sunnah is the way and practice of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. So he encouraged active lifestyles, healthy life, lifestyles through eating and, and exercise. And there were specific exercises that he also encouraged. So both young girls and boys are, of course, um, encouraged to maintain their health and well-being through exercise, fasting, eating well, but also through those three specific sports, which are swimming, archery and horseback riding. So you will find that many uh, Muslim families will um, have classes for their young children. They will either enroll them in swimming or um, maybe personally in their own homes or spaces will offer uh, swimming lessons for them. Also archery is very common. You'll find many Muslim children in archery or horseback riding. And this is all to fulfill this um, uh, sunnah sport uh, that is uh, highly encouraged. And in addition, martial arts is also really important just to protect oneself and to learn mastery and discipline and maintain health. So these are all ways that a lot of young Muslim children will, again, take on these practices to uh, align themselves spiritually. Now, just briefly, I, I don't want to go over too much, but the, the youth have a very high status in Islam. There are many passages uh, in the Quran and stories that actually have to do specifically with noble youth. Um, and I'll share some passages in a moment. But also many iconic figures, some shared with our Christian brothers and sisters like uh, Prophet Ismail, who was, of course, the son of, of Prophet Abraham. We know the sacrifice story. We believe that he um, you know, was a very young teenage boy when he submitted fully and willfully to the uh, God's command of the sacrifice. And so he's hailed as being, again, very virtuous in his own faith, in his own right, Aside from being the son of a prophet, he went on, of course, to also be a prophet in Islam. And then we have Maryam, or Mary, the mother of Jesus, peace be upon them both. We also believe that she was a young adolescent girl, and she is considered one of four perfect women. And in some uh, cases, uh, you know, she, because she received uh, that direct uh, revelation from uh, angel uh, Gabriel, some consider her also to be a prophet. Uh, so there are those opinions. And then we have um, Ali ibn Abi Talib, who is the uh, son-in-law and cousin of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, um, who later would go on to become the fourth caliph in Islam. He actually embraced the faith of Islam at the age of 11 and was considered a very, um, you know, uh, 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 his, his uh, youth was, was uh, uh, symbolic for many reasons because he came into the faith so early, but he's also hailed as being an icon of the faith because of his, um, you know, just uh, the, the intensity and the strength of his faith and the commitment of his faith. So uh, all of these are, and many more, there are other examples as well of youth that, that are uh, well known. But in, in the Quran specifically, and this will be, uh, I'll, I'll end after this, these are just some passages where youth are 
um, hailed or or lauded or just uh, you know their stories referenced about specific uh, youth that um, that were very strong in their conviction and faith. And so we have in chapter eighteen, verse ten. Here's a, a quote and uh, other quotes as well about um, specific youth in the time of Prophet Musa, chapter ten, verse eighty three. Musa or Moses, as we say in English. Um, and then also some other passages. So there's there's more. I just uh, got a handful here. But just to make the point that youth have always been, uh, ha had a very special or have a very special place in Islam and um, are treated, uh, depending on the different ages, with utmost care and respect and and uh, and really, um, you know, encouraged to embrace their identity at each level. So uh, that was the presentation that I had, and I'm here for any questions. I hope I didn't rush too much, and or and I hope I didn't go over either. Uh, so I'll go ahead and stop my my screen here, and I'm happy to answer any questions in the time that I have left. Hey, Marcia, do you want to put in? Okay, sure. Yeah. So, if people have questions, let's let's start with our in-person people. Is there? Can we take one question? To start with, from here, does anyone have a question for Hasai? Yes. <clears throat> so, if advancement is is um, determined by their physical maturity, so there's no age specific. So everyone advances at a different age when it's appropriate for them. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for uh, asking that because it's a it's really important to clarify. Yes, because there's no specific number and each child um, matures at their own pace, then it would be up to the families to discern, you know, when a child would then be responsible for themselves. Some, as we know, we have early bloomers, we have late bloomers, um, and so we really look at specific signs. So oftentimes. Those um, that that period of of adolescence is is signal or, or um, is um, is marked by very specific changes. The period the, the onset of the the menstruation for girls is typically when a girl would then be expected to conduct herself as an adult. That she has now left childhood, and so she would be responsible for herself. And then for boys, there would be um, changes like physical bodily hair or, um, uh, you know, other uh, experiences, um, you know, phys physiological changes that would onset or that would, uh, you know, indicate that the child has now left that you know childhood period and is is maturing into an adult state, but yeah, there's no set number. How about a question from someone in the Zoom participants? Then I'll have to unmute everyone. Bill and any Sorry. Well, people can just raise their hand and then yeah, themselves. Yeah, you can raise your hand and I'll see if yeah. I can. Someone have a question from the Zoom audience? There it is. Let's see everybody. <clears throat> so you want to say that allow, them, allow them to unmute themselves? I don't see anyone. Does here. anyone have a hand up or want to ask a question? You can wave your hand if you need to. I see Audrey, I think, has unmuted. I don't know if if that was on our end. But. Oh, I had a note that said the, the host would like you to unmute. So I, <laughs> oh. I don't know. Yes. Okay. <laughs> you follow direction. <laughs> I follow direction. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we could take one more question before we invite our second speaker up. So if there's no one in the Zoom audience with a question, how about somebody here? Chris? Yeah, the, uh, this might sound like a little bit of a negative question, I apologize now, but I'm curious, uh, for uh, children before the age of accountability, should, should a child die at, in childhood, uh, what happens to that child in the, in the judgment? 
Oh, that's a wonderful question. Thank you. Um, I mentioned earlier that children are considered in an age of purity, and that would apply to all children of all backgrounds, that any child before they reach the age of accountability would be considered in that state of uh, sinlessness and purity, and therefore they would be, um, there's a lot of actual, uh, in, in Islamic eschatology, more detail about what happens to children, but we believe that children are not questioned um, that die in childhood or or before that age and there is no accountability on them that they would be immediately uh you know um, in heaven and we actually have a uh, very descriptive um uh, passages or, or uh, quotes that indicate that they would be with Prophet Ibrahim, uh, peace be upon him, and all of the children that die in this earth, earthly realm are gathered by him, and he is the caretaker of all children in heaven awaiting the judgment day. So they have no um, no issue. They're just in heaven, enjoying heaven and waiting for for the for the next world. How about non-Muslim children? That'd be... Not just Muslim children. This would be all children, any child, any child of any background. It doesn't matter that we consider all children to be pure and sinless. Okay, thank you so much. Let's all give a big round of applause. To thank you all so much. It really, it's really right. an honor to speak to you with all of you. Thank Very you. Very excellent. Excellent. Such a clear speaker. Yes. Okay. And now our next speaker, Danae Andrus from Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I wonder if you want to recap because I recorded late. You might want to just talk to Hasni or or, or, or mention her background and so on. In, introduce oh, her again. Okay. We didn't turn the uh, recording on right at the very beginning, so you would have missed uh, anyone who's watching the uh, later watches the recording would have missed that Hasai is from um, Muslim Community Center, Pleasanton. Okay, and um, the topic, I guess I'll read that again. How does your community welcome children or youth into the faith? What rites of passage ceremonies are traditional in your culture? Okay, thanks, Ellen. All right. Renee, let's welcome Renee. So oh, thank you very much. I just want to quickly say to Hosai, that was so beautiful and well-spoken. And it also made me realize maybe how much I forgot and left out of what I wanted to say. <laughs> um, it's a good thing. We do have quite a bit in common. And I, and I love that we have these interfaith connections to learn about each other and to, to see we really do have a lot more in common, I think, than, or at least than I think. I can only speak from my personal experience. Now, in the New Testament books of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there's a, a story that is told as a very short one, but in the three books, it's got the same from obviously the different authors. Uh, Jesus' disciples were debating among themselves who was the most important. And so they asked him, which of them should be the greatest? And I'm sure they were expecting him to say, well, you are, of course. But instead, he brought over a child that was nearby. And he set them, he set the child in the middle of the disciples. And he further explained how important it is to be humble and teachable and loving, just like a child. Now, because children are very impressionable, and they will grow to be the next generation and our future leaders it's in the interest of our worldwide family to teach and nurture these children, not only in our homes, but in our communities of faith as well, which often act as extended family. So as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I would like to share, and like uh, Marsha has already talked about how we welcome children into our faith, as well as some of our rites of passages and our cultural experiences, but I would like to kind of do it in a more of a first person setting. And so when I was one and a half year old, one years old, my parents divorced and knowing that my mother would be taking care of my brother and I for most of the time, um, by order of the judge, I mean, because of the order of the judge, my, we would be in my, my, my mother's custody most of the time. My dad oddly enough, recommended that 
um, she look into the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints because my dad knew someone from his work and he knew he was a good family man. And for some reason that made an impression on him. And so reluctantly, my mom agreed to do so. And to make a long story short, she ended up um, learning more of the doctrine. And over the course of a couple months was baptized and confirmed in a church. And um, on the following Sunday, our names were read aloud from the pulpit. And um, people in the congregation, they raised their right arm and they welcomed us in. And that's kind of a, a more formal ritual, welcoming people into the church. Now, generally, when a baby is born to parents who are already members of our faith and is anywhere from maybe a few weeks to a few months old, uh, she is brought in front of the congregation to receive a blessing from her father and to have her name recorded on the records of the church. I say her, but it could be boy or girl. Uh, the family of the baby chooses male relatives, such as uncles or grandfathers, um, as well as close friends to participate in the blessing circle. So the dad will cradle the baby in his arms while the others in the circle put their right hand under the baby and their left hand on the shoulder of the person in front of them. And the blessing is actually more like a prayer that is not scripted and is generally no longer than two to three minutes in length. And the reason for that blessing is, is just that, to bless the child and to then also officially record um, the names upon the records of the church. But what about in cases like mine, where the father is unavailable for various reasons? And that is where a ministering brother or a sister will come into the picture. Now, in the case of actual blessings, that needs to be done by a, a male who is a priesthood holder. But um, every member of the church is assigned another brother or sister to minister to that family, no matter how big or small. And at the time, when I was a young girl, um, Stan Cochran was assigned to our family to make sure our needs were being met and to teach us from the scriptures to make sure our spiritual needs are being met as well. Now, there were, I do remember many other brothers and sisters stopping by, and I don't remember all their names, but Stan was the coolest. That's why I remember him. <laughs> um, he you know, sometimes bring us little candy here or there, but um, my mom, it was, it was pretty hard. I remember she did, she did work as a, a bookkeeper and stuff, but uh, we lived out in the country, and she was barely making ends meet. Um, there were times I remember he would, uh, he organized uh, members of the congregation to come and help put a new roof on our house. Um, one time, my mother, uh, for Christmas time, she told us, you know, she had tears in her eyes. She told us we wouldn't be having presents that year. And of course, a couple days later, there was a anonymous basket left at our at our front porch, and I. I got a little stuffed puppy. I remember that too. Um, so I was very thankful for these other brothers and sisters who would come and, and help look, look after us. Now, um, throughout my childhood, on Sundays at least, um, well, let me back up just a little bit more. The, the church and what we teach really is or should be uh, home-centered and church supported, meaning that the majority of what we learn as children should be taught in, in our homes and then enriched by the meetings we have either on Sundays or the occasional meetings during the week. And that, um, in fact, I don't know how long ago, but many, many years ago before I was born, uh, there was even set aside of Monday nights and we termed it family home evening, still called that today. Uh, we, you have a little lesson and um, an activity because it's also important to have fun. It's not all about um, cracking the books, but it is about um, that family wholesome together time. Um, 
I, so back to my childhood, I did attend church for three hours. <laughs> and for the first hour, the whole congregation meets together. Everyone, everyone is together. And then the second and third hour, the, the, well, was adult Sunday school for the second hour. And um, then after that, the women would meet together or the men would be separate. Well, for the children, uh, the, the second hour we would have, um, well, I guess depending on age group, you would have a time where you would sing together and have more of a group lesson. And the songs are absolutely beautiful. They're all, well, we do have some get the wiggles out songs, but um, we also have songs that are teach children the doctrine, the most simple doctrine, the very um, simple way. For example, there are songs that talk about we came before we came to earth, we, we lived. We were spirits, we're born here, and then after we die, life does not end, it continues on. But there's these beautiful songs, and luckily in 2018. Um, the prophet announced that church would no longer be three hours, but two hours. So that's been consolidated. And so now when the children, in fact, I paid attention this last Sunday. It was very sweet. After the congregation met for the sacrament meeting, um, uh, not very reverent or dignified, but many of the children did run to the corner where, where, where the room is for them to meet. So that was good because it showed me that they were excited. To, to go see their teachers and to meet with them and to sing and to have their lessons. Now, when I turned eight years old, I was able to be baptized. So in our church, uh, the age of eight is what we term to be the age of accountability. And it's not because we're always making the best choices, but it is about the age of eight that we really do have the concept between right and wrong. And uh, a baptism in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, um, the child will put on a white suit or dress. That's just a personal preference. The father, or in my case, I chose Stan, Brother Cochran, of course, because he was amazing and I trusted him. And um, you go down into a baptismal font and there is the same prayer this time that is said every time for a baptism. And we believe in baptism by immersion. And so the, the child, in this case, will be immersed under, underwater and brought back up. After that uh, is the opportunity for the child to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And the actual small ceremony is looks uh, a lot like the baby blessing where um, the men in the circle will put the hand on the head of the child and then the left arm on the shoulder of the person in front of them and is pronounced, uh, will then receive the gift of the Holy Ghost to be able to be guided in um, a more conscious way throughout life to hopefully make better decisions. We believe that the Holy Ghost is a teacher. He testifies of the truth and helps us to make good decisions. And also will bring things to our remembrance that we, that we need to remember. Now, when I turned 12, or when the children turned 12, that's when we can enter into the, either the young men or the young women program. And it used to be that um, the boys would be involved in the scouting but that is no longer um, how we do it in church. It's just, just young men through, through the church and the young women. Now, I was so excited to, to go into the young women because I really looked up to the older girls and I could then be just like them and be one of them. At the age of 12, the boys have the opportunity to receive the Aaronic Priesthood, which gives them then the authority to uh, pass the sacrament or in other churches might be called the Lord's Supper and to um, to bless the sacrament as well. Um, girls, we welcome each other. Um, can, can be like a, a formal um, 
more, a more of a formal ceremony as uh, the parents would be invited, the, the families would be invited, and there might be a, a musical presentation and where each of the girls would be introduced and then maybe a fun activity or a, a treat planned. But um, often these days, when, when the girls turn 12, they are welcomed by the older girls, maybe with like a pancake breakfast or whatever the older girls plan on, on doing. Uh, something fun for the girls to make them feel special. Now there's the Sunday meetings, but um, and each Sunday meeting, and I forgot to print this out, but the, the, the girls recite a theme, and so do the young men these days. And um, it's the same thing, theme, and um, maybe I could look that up later. You could just type in young men's theme or, or young women's theme for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and it's online. I do apologize, I didn't do that. We have youth activity nights during the week. Um, some are more spiritual in nature. Some are more service oriented in nature, could be maybe tying quilts or building things for families in need. It just depends. Some are almost just pure game nights. It, there's just a variety of things that they do. It's generally on Tuesday or Wednesday nights. Uh, the, then the youth have the opportunity to also be a part of their class presidency. For example, right now, my daughter is part of the 12 to 13 year old class presidency. And there are not many of those girls in our specific congregation. I think there's six girls, but that gives them a chance to uh, learn some leadership position, to care for the other girls, to pray for them by name, to, um, to take responsibility. Uh, they also have a chance to speak in front of the whole congregation. It's generally a five-minute, four-minute uh, speaking assignment that maybe the bishop will call and ask them. And they might have to do this once uh, every year or two years. And it gives them a public speaking as well as a chance to um, study up on, on a specific topic. And um, camp is the one that, that I really, really love. And if you ask the youth, that's one of the things that they really look forward to is once a year, they have a, a summer camp. It's about a week long and they learn all sorts of things. It's just a time to be away from technology. It's a time to um, commune with God in a different way in nature. Lots of fun activities planned, but, but a lot of togetherness and that was just so important. And um, the, the, the leaders that I remember made such a big difference in my youth, such a difference. Um, I know we don't always, I did not always appreciate the advice that my parents gave me, but I was sure to listen to the advice that the other good leaders gave me. And I'm very grateful for that. Now, also when I entered high school and when the youth enter high school, um, most, most of the youth go to an early morning seminary class. I wasn't always excited to wake up at 545, but I did it. And um, it's worth the extra mornings and efforts. In fact, I had come across some of my journals that I had written. I, I didn't even remember writing a journal that much when I was in high school. But I was going through some boxes during, during quarantine and I came across some of my journals and I, I often mentioned how grateful I was to be able to go to seminary in the early mornings. And I think it was because, well, I know it was because high school is a hard time of life. You've got a lot of things bombarding you and people trying to pull you in different directions. And it was nice to be able to go to seminary every school morning and have, I think at the time it was like a 45 minute instruction time. And every High school year, um, with the four years, we studied a different script set of scripture. So, for example, uh, one year, in fact, I think I happened to be in that order. It was Old Testament my freshman year, then New Testament, then the Book of Mormon, and then the Doctrine and Covenants and Pearl of Great Price. And I'm just, I'm just very grateful. It seriously does take a village to raise a child. And I'm grateful for the village that I had and for 
all the people involved in my kid's life as well. And so thank you for this opportunity to speak. <laughs> Question. Oh, yes. Okay, so um, Renee, um, how about a question from the in-person people? Anyone have one ready right now who hasn't asked a question yet? Okay. Uh, people have oh. questions. But, uh, okay, Ho hold off for just a moment, pressure. Chris. But you can. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, let's look at online and see. Alan, can you throw uh, yeah, those things out? Yeah, had a question. Is there a concept of original sin in LDS Church? Um, no, there is not. In that instance, I'd say we are um, very close to the Muslim community uh, that we believe that Jesus Christ, well, okay, so we back that up a little bit. So we, we do believe that children are innocent, okay? And then from there, we do believe that they're innocent because Jesus Christ atoned for our sins. And it um, children, and if you wanted to ask the same Christian question, Chris, that was asked earlier about if what happens if a child dies before the age of accountability, um, they would receive like the highest order of heaven to be exaltation are not really capable of committing sin or that at least has already been paid for by by christ and how about back to the room anyone oh, well, was, yeah, was, Chris, yes. another question doesn't does anyone else have a question no, let's go let's Chris have another turn then go maybe it's considered to post youth but the the importance of bishop I okay, sure. Bring it up. I know it's very big. Okay, um, yes, it, it is. Um, so I suppose you could say it's a commandment that uh, for the young men, anyway, to serve a mission. And it is encouraged or um, very welcome for the young women to do so as well. The age changes have, it changes have. What I'm trying to say is the ages have changed. I believe it's 18 now for for both men and women. It used to be a little older. I think men were at 19, women at 21 before they could go on a mission. And now it's 18 across the board for, for anyone, male or female, to go. Is it one year? One year? Um, two years. Two years. Uh -huh. Or a year and a half for, for women. Another kind of practical question in terms of the morning seminary. Oh, sure. How did you actually get to that? Did, you, did your parents have to drive you or something? Well, at the time, so what I didn't tell you was my mom got remarried at the age of 10. And then we had eight children in our family at the ha at home. <laughs> so I personally got to seminary because that was my ride also to school. Uh, we lived out in the country, but um, there was, that was in the morning, we all just, Got, got in the car and went. Um, then I could drive after a while. And so I drove and I drove my younger siblings as well. Then, <laughs> so. Was it at the school or was it at the church? It was at the church. Yeah. Now, um, there was a church close enough to my high school. I grew up in Clovis, uh, in the Fresno area. And there's kind of a large, larger population of members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints down there. And so at our particular building at the time, this was, what, um, 91 to 95, there were like over 100 students in the morning who attended that same building, generally. Mm -hmm. Interesting. A lot of times the, the LDS churches are near uh, schools, so they have part of the reason. <laughs> yes, crazy. well, I know in, in Utah, where, where more members of the church are per capita, they actually have a release time from school where they could go like across the street and do that. That's part of their oh, allowed curriculum. Okay. Alan, is there another question on the chat? No, I don't. Okay. Just a lot of the thank yous for, okay. the, for, for the talk. Okay. But no other questions okay. that I can see. I don't see any hands on the screen. Okay, well, let's give Renee. Yeah. All right, so we're get back here. 
It's right up here. Okay, it looks like we're ready to uh, move on to the next portion. Um, we will break into small groups for anyone who would like to do that. And we may have a little, I'm not sure exactly how to work this out, but if people, people um, on Zoom, if you want to hold on just for a minute, I'll make some announcements. And then what we've usually done for Zoom is anyone after the announcements who wants to stay for a breakout group, they stay and other people sign off. So we know how many people that we have to figure out the sound so that we're not hearing anyone we'll, talk. We'll do that here. Maybe we can't do that. We'll not do that today. Oh, okay. So we might, sorry, if, if you are on Zoom today, I can guess. Can we just mute the TV? Sorry? You can just mute the TV. And they can I guess leave the TV and everyone can talk here if there's a dis discussion that we want to have. That certainly. We could do that. But if people really want to break into small groups, um, well, we could just leave it if people want to discuss. Um, sometimes it's nice to be able to speak in small groups. Looks like there are, what, about six, seven people seven, left. Seven there now. So if we assign people into the small groups, they they won't be heard, I don't think. Will they be heard? <laughs> no, I don't they'll think they will. Themselves, right? Yeah, they'll only hear themselves, yeah. Okay, so I think we can do that. Yeah. And then for here, <laughs> we can just break into little clusters. But um, let's see. So for the next religion chat, June 8th, Zoom and in person, and we will be meeting at Muslim Community Center in Pleasanton. We have that we're going to be doing the same topic. And our speakers are already committed. They are Trish Monroe from Congregation Beth Emick and representing the Sikh religion, Karan Sani. Not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly. He is just completing high school. So apparently he's going to speak from his personal experience. So that should be very interesting. Again, they're going to be speaking about how does your community welcome children new into the faith? What rite of passage ceremonies are traditional in your culture? So I'm going to thank our presenters again, and thank you everyone for coming, whether you came on Zoom or in person. I think it, if I may say so, <laughs> considering it's our first hybrid, things went pretty well. I uh, thank everyone again for coming.